Hello, thank you for joining. I'm sorry I couldn't be there in person today, but I'm glad we were able to still get a recording in place and I hope you find this informative. So I'm Parmir Delay. I'm the Director of GI Clinical Trials and Precision Medicine at Northwestern University. And I'm excited to talk to you today about what's currently available in terms of new treatments and what we're gonna be seeing down the pipeline for new horizons for how we treat IBD. These are my relevant disclosures. And here's our program disclosure. So we've seen a rapid growth in drug development for inflammatory bowel disease. So back in the 50s, 60s, and 70s, all we had available to us were different formulations of 5-ASAs and steroids. And then it wasn't until 1995 when we started getting infliximab and then subsequently adalimumab, sertilizumab, uh, golimumab, betalizumab, and then eustachinumab most recently. And now, just in the last three years, we've had four new drugs come to market with tofacidinib, Upatacidinib, which just came to market this year, Ozanimod, which is now available, and Rizinkizumab, which is also now available. And we're seeing tremendous growth in several new drugs that are coming down the pipeline. I'm not going to spend too much time talking about Tofacidinib and Upatacidinib because these have Tofacidinib's been around for a few years, and Upatacidinib is of a similar mechanism. But I do want to spend some time talking about Rizinkizumab in the emerging IL-23 inhibitors and Ozanimod and what this new Ozanimod mechanism really looks like and what you should be thinking about with this. So when we talk about IL-23 inhibitors, we have hopefully some experience and understanding with Eustachinumab, which was an IL-1223 inhibitor. So I'm showing you the receptors here on the left because I want you to understand what the difference is here. So eustachinumab targeted a P40 subunit. So because it targets that P40, it blocks both 12 and 23. The newer IL-23 specific ones block P19. So they're really focused on just the IL-23 receptor. And why is that? That's because the IL-12 does cause some inflammation, but there's some thought that in certain scenarios, IL-12 may also actually help minimize or prevent inflammation or help resolve inflammation. So the thinking is that by targeting IL-23 alone, we might get some better benefit in its anti-inflammatory property compared to targeting both with eustachinumab. And we're actually gonna go through some of that data today. So the four ones that are being developed, Rizinkizumab, which is actually now available for Crohn's disease, Gaselkumab, which we anticipate should be available soon, hopefully, Brezikumab and Mirakizumab, which we're also hopeful will be available soon for ulcerative colitis first. So when we talk about first, let's set up with our predecessor for Eustachinumab. There was a really nice quality head-to-head -head clinical trial comparing Eustachinumab to Adalimumab in Crohn's disease. This is only the second head-to-head -head trial that's been done in inflammatory bowel disease to date. And this showed that Eustachinumab was comparable to adalimumab in achieving clinical remission and steroid-free clinical remission in early Crohn's disease patients. So what you should take away from this is that eustachinumab is about as good as anti-TNF therapy in Crohn's disease patients, and you're seeing remission rates in the 60% range. In this trial, eustachinumab had a better safety profile. There was a significantly lower rate of adverse events, and what we're seeing from our own evidence and prior literature is that you can use eustachinumab alone much more often than you could with anti-TNF therapy, where you often have to use adalimumab with an immunomodulator such as azathioprine or imuran or 6MP. Now getting over and thinking about the IL-23 inhibitors with that context in mind, the drug that's now available, Rizinkizumab, this is a really good drug. It's available to you for Crohn's disease. And this is the phase three data that came out just recently that's led to its FDA approval. So what I want to highlight here is that the top part of this is showing you the overall response rates. So the overall response rates for what we have is the Crohn's disease activity index for clinical remission. We're about 40 to 45% for Rizinkizumab versus a little bit over 20% for placebo. And this was very significant. Most notably, though, they broke down the stool frequency and abdominal pain scores, and the, this drug was shown to be efficacious for improving stool frequency and abdominal pain, which are probably the two symptoms that we hear most from patients as bothersome. And then endoscopic response for this, within 12 weeks, this drug was healing the colon and healing the bowel in almost 40% of patients, which was actually higher than we were expecting to have such a response within just 12 weeks of treatment. The bottom graph here is just broken out by whether patients had failed a prior biologic therapy like anti-TNF therapy or not. And you can see with the 
each column on the left side, those with prior biofailure versus the right side, those without prior biofailure. The drug seems to do better when it's used first, but it does still work well in patients who have failed prior therapies. So I think this is definitely something that we're gonna to start to use a lot more often now and something that we're gonna progressively consider as part of our armamentarium. When we look at the long-term maintenance data or sort of the one-year maintenance data, we're seeing similar results. You can see here that the maintenance remission rates are about 60%, both for clinical remission and endoscopic response at the top. And when you look down at the bottom for prior biofailure versus without prior biofailure, uh, you can again see that the remission rates at one year were 60 to 70% for patients who had no previous biologic exposures versus 40 to 50% for those with. Either way, it looks like it works very well, and you can expect this to be efficacious once you're responding and to maintain that response over time. So this is a really promising drug that's now FDA approved for Crohn's disease treatment. But that brings into question, well, what about ustekinumab or Solara versus this new kit on the block with Rizinkizumab? And there's actually a trial that was done comparing the two in Crohn's disease patients to give us an understanding of what might be the difference between these two. So the Galaxy trials were done for Guselcumab. This one isn't approved yet for Crohn's disease, but we're anticipating hopefully that it'll become available soon versus used to can you remember Stellara, which is available now. And what I'm showing you here is the early induction data, which showed that on the far right, you can see the purple was used to can you map. The, the graph is the overall change in the Crohn's disease activity index, and the different green bars are the different doses of Gaselcumab. And you can see that overall, both of these drugs were more efficacious than placebo, which was in gray, which we would expect because we know ustekinumab is an effective drug. And that maybe there was a little bit more benefit with gaselcumab. But again, this is just 12 weeks of treatment. What was most surprising to us, actually, is what we saw with the maintenance data. So the, the one-year outcome data was presented at Digestive Disease Week this past year. And what you're seeing here is the blue bars are the used to kinumab treated patients. And the different colored bars, blue, yellow, the light blue, yellow, and orange are the different doses of gaselcumab. And you're looking at one-year clinical remission rates, so resolution of uh, clinical symptoms based on the CDAI, steroid-free clinical remission, ability to taper off steroids, and then endoscopic response, as well as changes in biomarkers. And on the left, you can see that clinical remission and steroid free remission for the caselcumab dose of 600 and 200 looks like it's a bit higher than used to kinumab, but overall, at least all the doses together were comparable. But what was most striking was when you looked at the endoscopic response data, the endoscopic response rates were 30% for used to kinumab at one year, but they were consistently above 40% for gaselcumab at one year, regardless of which dose was used. So this is beginning to suggest that maybe what we thought was going to be the case is actually going to be the case when we deal with these IL-23 inhibitors in routine practice. There was another study recently that was also completed, which actually looked at trying to combine these two drugs, combine two drugs together. So anti-TNF therapy is available in routine practice. Several of them are available in Fliximab or Remicade, Adalimumab or Humira, and Golimumab, which is Symphony. What the company did was they actually wanted to understand, well, what happens if we try to combine two of these together, recognizing their different mechanisms of action? Can we get more bang for our buck if we actually target patients with both drugs together? And is that safe? And so what they did was a study where they randomized patients to get golimumab to guselcumab, the IL-23 inhibitor, or both together. And what you can see here for the clinical remission rates in ulcerative colitis, this is an ulcerative colitis trial, that the remission rates for the combination of the two were nearly double the remission rates for either of those individually. And there was no significant difference for safety uh, issues when combining the two. So this is beginning to open up a question for us as to whether we can be to combine different mechanisms of biologics together to actually synergistically interact or at least stack the effect and get both of them to work well. And if we do this early on, get patients into remission, then maybe we can actually use two by biologics to induce remission more efficiently, and then peel back one of the biologics and keep patients on the safer of the two or the more convenient of the two, giving us a lot more choice and really avoiding any questions up front on how we can optimize getting people into remission to begin with. Now, I want to shift gears a little bit and spend a little bit of time talking about this new drug that's come on market, Ozanamide. 
because this is a new mechanism of action. And I think it's important for patients to understand what this is. So ozanamide blocks the S1P receptor. So what is an S1P receptor and why are we trying to block it? So an S1P receptor allows the immune cells to go from your lymph nodes into your blood vessels to sites of inflammation. So what they do is they create this gradient of receptor activation, which serves as a homing mechanism for these immune cells to come out of the lymph nodes and go towards the sites of inflammation like a shark following blood. And these receptors, when activated, can migrate these immune cells out to the area of inflammation. So what the S1P receptor blockers do is they block this gradient. So they block those receptors from being activated and they force the immune cells to stay in the lymph nodes, sort of this Hotel California type of situation. And by blocking these, lymph, these immune cells from coming out of the lymph nodes, you can prevent them from going to sites of inflammation and allow that inflammation to resolve. These are, are expressed throughout our body in various different locations. So the receptors that we're going to be targeting in IBD are really focused on receptors in the gut, but some of these receptors are located elsewhere, such as your heart, your eyes, or your brain. So when you're getting these treatments started, there is some pre-treatment testing to make sure you don't have underlying cardiac issues or vision issues. Doesn't mean that the drugs themselves have a risk of heart disease or vision issues, but we just need to make sure that we're looking for patients who have, may have pre-existing conditions that could be worsened by taking these medications. When we look at the evidence around Ozanamod, which is available now, um, you can see from the clinical trial data that this is a very efficacious treatment for ulcerative colitis. So when we look at clinical remission, which was resolution of rectal bleeding and normalization in your stool frequency, the, it was highly significant differences for the drug versus placebo. And again, this was significant across every outcome clinical remission, clinical response, endoscopic improvements, maintenance of remission, complete mucosal healing. Ozanamod was more efficacious than placebo across everything in the maintenance studies. What was most striking was recently we had some data from Digestive Disease Week on the durability of effect out to possibly up to seven years. Um, so this is two to three year data where they looked at patients who got ozanamod in the clinical trial and then maintained it or went from placebo onto ozanamod. So just as a, a preface here, Traditionally with anti-TNF therapy or other biologics, we expect that about a third or more, if not 40 to 50% of patients will lose response within two years, maybe up to 50 to 60% within five years. So we expect people to lose response with some of those drugs, partly because of immunogenicity, partly because of some escape mechanism. What we're seeing with these small molecule drugs like ozanamide is that almost 90% of these patients can maintain response for up to three years and not lose that response. What was really interesting was that some of the patients had this natural event where they got ozanamide, then they got randomized to placebo, so they came off the drug, and then they went back on ozanamide. And nearly 60% of those patients who lost response after ozanamide was stopped were able to be recaptured. So even if you have a drug gap or if you have to stop it for a little bit, we're able to recapture response just as well as we did before. So this is going to bring up an interesting question for us down the road. If we get patients into remission on ozanamod or these small molecules and everything looks healed up, could we actually consider stopping it and then watching patients and withdrawing therapy? Because we've always had to assume we need to treat patients lifelong because with older drugs like Remicade, if we stopped the drug, you develop antibodies and we really couldn't cycle back to it. Now with small molecules, there's a possibility we could treat you as needed, get you into remission and then consider tapering it away. We don't have the evidence to support that quite yet, but this is evidence that suggests maybe we should begin to think about that. And that's something that I think is gonna be really helpful for patients down the road. So what I'd really like you to walk away from this is that there are several new treatments that are already available or becoming available in the IL-23 and the S1P receptor class. And we have new JAK inhibitors that are coming out as well. They're effective and I didn't go over the safety data, but the safety data was quite good for all of these new drugs. And the outcomes were comparable to anti-TNF therapy, but immunogenicity rates are lower with newer biologics and you can use them as monotherapy. 
the future of management might be the combination of multiple different drugs together to make sure that we can get every patient into remission and then beginning to peel back drugs one at a time. And maybe down the road, we'll get to a point where we can actually think about withdrawing those drugs altogether, but we're not quite there yet. And that's why I think personalized approaches will really be the key to success. And I hope future studies will come out that we can share with you where we look at personalization of some of these decisions. So thank you again for taking the time to spend some time with us. I know it was a high level overview of what's on the horizon, but there's a lot of promise and make sure you talk about some of these new therapies with some of your providers.